Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is the science of life after death. My guest is Professor Alexander Moera Almeida. He is a Brazilian psychiatrist editor of the anthology Exploring the Frontiers of Mind-Brain Relationships, Spirituality and Mental Health Across Cultures, and co-author of a new volume, The Science of Life After Death, which was based on his essay for the Bigelow Institute Competition on the Best Evidence for the Survival of Human Consciousness After Permanent Bodily Death. Alexander is based in Brazil, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Alexander. It's a pleasure to be with you once again. Hi, Jeff. Thank you very much. My pleasure of being here. Congratulations for all the work you have done. Well, I think it's wonderful that you were able to essentially take your Bigelow essay, the essay for the Bigelow competition on the best evidence for the afterlife, and get it published as, as a mainstream textbook by a major academic publisher. Yeah, I think it, it was very interesting because... Uh, it, the book, the the essay, the big the Bigelow essay was a collaborative work uh, between uh, two friends, one philosopher uh, Umberto Schubert Coelho, and another psychiatrist Mariana Costa and myself, and we worked together throughout a whole year discussing the evidence and making and analyzing the evidence and all that stuff. So we we thought that this. A uh, summary that it's about 100 pages only could be useful to be uh, knowledge by a wider audience, specifically in the academic environment, especially those uh, intellectual students and researchers that are not well aware of the survival evidence that exists. And, and we are very happy also, just to let you know, that in the book, uh, uh, we we were able to get some mainstream academic journals. They will publish book reviews of the, uh -huh. the book. So the British Journal of Psychiatry will we, publish a, a book review of it. The Royal College of Psychiatrists in UK also will publish. The uh, uh, International Journal of Social Psychiatry from the World Psychiatric Association will also publish book reviews on it. So we hope... Uh, People that are not very aware of the survival research will have the chance to to access this knowledge and who, who knows open their minds to this possibility. That's wonderful. You're making real inroads into the academic world. Now I know we did a previous interview on mediumship in uh, Brazil, and, and in fact I'm going to link to it right now because I think it'll be useful for our viewers to uh, watch that video in prepar preparation perhaps for this one or to augment this video. I think it's also very significant to me at least that in your country, Brazil, it seems to me that the acceptance of the afterlife based on the evidence of mediumship is, is more widespread, I think, than in any other country. Yeah, I think in, in the Brazilian history, uh, we have had many influences related to mediumistic experiences, especially from African religions, indigenous religions, and also from the spiritism. Spiritism is a, a major religious force in Brazil also, and several mediums became very famous in Brazil, uh, both for their charitable enterprise and also by their very impressive mediumistic writings and uh, mediumistic productions. So uh, it became very uh, well known in Brazil, and so it's part, definitely it's part of our culture. 
And in your book, for example, you emphasize the work done with uh, Chico Xavier, the Brazilian medium who, as I recall, parapsychologist from England, Guy Lyon Playfair, wrote a book about him referring to him as, as the greatest medium of the 20th century. Yeah, exactly. Playfair has a, a very good biography on Chico Xavier. And actually, one of the essays from the Bigelow contest uh, was about Chico Xavier, and this essay was one among the, of the selected essays to, to receive some prize. And yes, uh, Chico Xavier, unfortunately, he, he uh, was not uh, well investigated while alive. Uh, and what I think is most impressive is the the broad range of surviving evidence, survival evidence that he provided. He started when he was 22 years old with four years of education, living in a countryside of Brazil, uh, publishing a book with a, a, a tribute to dozens of deceased Brazilian Portuguese poets and and having poems very, very similar to each of these poets. So it's, it's really, really impressive. And there are some studies, academic studies, on, on, on comparison of it. In addition to this uh, kind of poetic skills, um, uh, showing the, the skills of each specific poet, not only the poetic style, but also the knowledge, the, the, the personal approach, and so on and so forth, he also produced... Um, many books, actually, four hundred more than four hundred books through automatic writing, covering a wide range of subjects from history novels, scientific uh, developments, including there is uh, there are some books that talks about the pineal gland in the nineteen forties uh, with several informations about the pineal gland that were actually uh, discovered by science some decades later. And in addition, the, 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 the next very important evidence that he produced was the letters attributed to deceased people. So uh, parents who lost their children often went to him and they received the letters attributed to these deceased children. And, and we also have published some papers in academic journals investigating the precision of the information and what would be the likelihood that Chico would have access to this information by regular means. And basically, the informations were almost everything precise, very detailed information, and many of, uh, of, of these pieces of information, it's very unlikely that she could have access to this through the regular means. So it, it definitely he is. Uh, and in addition, in addition to all of this, he was also a person uh, very well respected in Brazil from people in different religions because of, of his whole life de de dedicated to charity. He had a regular job. He retired as a humble public servant. He had his regular job. But um, throughout all his life, 90 years, uh, he had an uh, exemplary life of dedication to the, to the neighborhood. You know, in my own essay for the Bigelow competition, I referred to, I think, two different instances in, uh, involving the criminal courts in which, uh, at least in, in one of those, an individual was accused of murder. It was an accidental gunshot, and uh, Chico was contacted by the parents, as I recall, of the uh, accused person who who contacted the deceased, who, who explained that the whole thing was an accident and he didn't uh, blame the person who shot him. Uh, he accidentally, they were playing with a gun, and he accidentally walked in front of the gun. And the judge, who was not a spiritist, uh, accepted this as evidence in court. And the person was acquitted. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. This is, uh, this is part of our history. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, as I recall, the Brazilian government even issued a postage stamp with Chico Xavier's picture on it. Yeah, he, he was uh, in some uh, votes 
that we had in the Brazilian population, he quite often is selected one of the most uh, outstanding Brazilians in Brazil history. Well, an important part of your book is looking at the arguments raised by uh, honest skeptics and even the scoffers who are somewhat a, a rung below the honest skeptics. Uh, how do people who don't accept the authenticity of uh, Chico's mediumship, how, what are the arguments that they raise? Are there any legitimate arguments? Yeah, I think one of the major uh, stumbling blocks uh, that avoid um, dispassionate and more rational analysis of the available evidence for survival are some philosophical misconceptions. The first one, I think perhaps the, the most important one, is the, the physicalism. The idea that science has proved physicalism. Physicalism in the sense that everything that exists is composed by matter, physical or particles, physical force or particles. So this idea that science has proved physicalism or that science requires physicalism, that the only thing that exists is matter, uh, this idea, of course, excludes any possibility of survival, any possibility of any trans transcendental or um, spiritual, actual spiritual experience. So I think this is one of the major uh, aspects. The second uh, misconception related to physicalism is that neuroscience, they believe that neuroscience has proved that the brain generates the mind. So uh, only the chemical and electrical activity of the brain can explain the mind. And of course, when the brain is not working anymore, the mind cannot exist anymore. So I think this two, uh, and it's important to keep in mind that actually it has not been proved. Of course, this is a hypothesis. This is a respectable hypothesis that the brain generates mind, but is far from being a scientific fact. In the same sense, physicalism is actually a metaphysical assumption that is also respectable, a respectable metaphysical assumption. But the problem is then this metaphysical assumption is presented as a scientific fact or a necessary base for science. Just to, to give an example, uh, very interesting, because quite often people think that scientific psychology, that neuroscience has uh, started from rejecting non-material aspects of human beings and as uh, promoting physicalist perspectives of human beings. However, it's interesting to see that the founders of scientific psychology, like Wilhelm Wundt and William James, they were not physicalists. And also, two of the major founders of neuroscience, like Sir Charles Sherrington and Wilbur Penfield, both also were actually dualists. They were not physicalists. So it's, it's quite a misconception perceiving that uh, neuroscience and scientific psychology are necessarily promoting or are necessarily based on physicalist perspect perspectives of human beings. I think these are the two major uh, problems that uh, blocks any uh, good analysis of the, um, uh, the available evidence. Of course, the per as I said, the person can take these two positions as hypotheses. But if they assume them as dogmas, uh, they would uh, not allow at least to take a look at the evidence. And uh, yeah, I think these are the two major problems. And later we can discuss more specific questions to more, to more specific evidence on survival. Well, I'm puzzled because Considering that, as you point out, some of the leading figures in psychology and in uh, neuroscience are dualists, uh, or at least not physicalists, how did it become such a dominant social movement so that people assume without any actual basis that physicalism was proven long ago? 
Yeah, I think this is a very interesting uh, theme for sociological, for sociology and history of science, how it happened during the most of 20th century to have this more physicalist perspectives assumed as uh, uh, the scientific view of human view of human beings. But it's also interesting to see that actually the prevalence of physicalist views are not as prevalent as people quite often think. Just to give an example, uh, we have performed a survey with 600 psychiatrists in Brazil, and half of them hold physicalist views and half had non-physicalist views. There was a, a very interesting also survey among leading philosophers in Europe, North America, and Australia. And, and this, um, a, this survey showed that a strictly monist physicalist view of the mind-brain relationship was accepted by about only one-third of these leading philosophers. And there is also another research with health professionals and uh, health students in universities in Europe also that showed that at least half of them also hold non-physicalist views. So actually, it's, it's important to see that uh, these physicalist views are not so hegemonic as sometimes is, uh, is thought. But of course, uh, why it became so prevalent discourse on, uh, on, the, on the topic, it, it, it definitely needs to be better investigated. You know, just off the top of my head, I, I imagine that it might have something to do with, for example, uh, well, the great successes of technology. The nuclear bomb, for example, seems to show that, you know, using a physicalist perspective, you can blow up a whole city. And I, I imagine that just imprints on people's minds. I, th I think, yeah, definitely. The, the huge advances promoted by material science, of course, they are very impressive and very important. But the, the, the whole point is uh, this physical science, they can explain everything that exists. That's the point. Uh, sometimes we extrapolate too much from a specific finding. Sometimes we become so excited about one specific uh, uh, form of evidence of or of causation that we tend to attribute everything to that uh, to, to that cause, for example. I think that's the point, and I think it's also very important to, to stress that when we are talking about non-material aspects of human being, we are not at all denying science as a whole, and we are not denying at all the scientific knowledge that we know. This is also another misconception, the idea that if we assume, for example, that we as human beings, we have a non-material aspect, mind, spirit, consciousness, whatever we call it, if we see this as a non-material aspect of ourselves, it does not mean neglect or reject the whole knowledge, the whole scientific knowledge that we have. We, we would be only adding a new knowledge. That's the point. Of course, because I, I know more about genes, I do not need to deny the evidence of, of environment. However, we know in the history of science, there is always this discussion between nurture and nature. Some people that only think that genetics explains everything. There are the other people that think that the environment explains everything. We know that actually we need both to explain things. And the point is we can, we may be, we, we may need to add a third aspect, nurture, the, the, uh, the, the, Nature, nurture, the genetics, the biology, the environment, and perhaps a new dimension. So the, the, the point is never to, re, to neglect or to dismiss what we already know, but actually add a new uh, kind of explanation that could interact with the other two that we know. 
Well, one of the features of, of your book is a focus on the evidence for reincarnation. And I would think that you, as a psychiatrist, would be particularly interested in this because the reincarnation data seems to point to the origin of, of certain psychiatric problems like phobias. Yeah, exactly. Actually, this is one of the major reasons why this the scientific investigation of uh, cases, uh, uh, alleged case of reincarnation, was this whole field was started by Ian Stevenson. Ian Stevenson was a psychiatrist, as you know, from the University of Virginia, and he was he was a, a child psychiatrist, a and so he was very interested in trying to understand uh, mental disorders among children. And in his investigations, he was. Uh, able to, to to find that several of these symptoms, for example, some phobias, could not be explained by what children have lived in their current life, but these phobias would match very well with alleged previous lives. But what, what is more more interesting uh, is that um, Erdo Haraldson, uh, a psychologist from the University of Iceland, he had found that children who have symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorders, but they have never been exposed to a, to a truly traumatic experience in this life. But these symptoms were uh, would fit with the claimed previous life when they, for example, died for an accident, for a violent death, whatever. So again, as also you Stevenson said, that the point is not to deny the biology, the genetics, not denying the environment, but to add a new perspective that could help us to explain, for example, also identical twins, identical twins that share basically all their genetic all their genes, they have, uh, they share the environment a lot, but quite often they have striking, striking different personalities and other stuff. So, in another aspect also related to, to reincarnation that's very interesting are the birthmarks and birth defects that the children not only re uh, claim to remind, to remember uh, previous lives, they and they make accurate. Uh, information about a previous life that can be checked. It, they also have phobias or other psychiatric symptoms that are correlated with that experience, but that do not make sense with the current experience. And also, in addition, they have personality traits related and very similar to that previous personality. And also, they have birthmarks and birth defects quite often related to fatal wounds in their previous lives. And quite often, these uh, birthmarks and birth defects match very closely with the post-mortem uh, records uh, of the medical examination of the corpse in the previous life. So this is also a whole body of evidence that also adds very much to the survival research. Not long ago, I did interview a, a fellow Charles Upton, he considers himself a traditionalist, a school of uh, spiritual thought based on the writings of René Guénon, the French metaphysician. And uh, th their argument is that reincarnation, uh, the data of reincarnation, uh, they interpret it as what they call metempsychosis, by which they mean that the memories carry over, various traits can carry over. As you point out, even physical things can carry over. But that doesn't still mean that you are the same soul that inhabited the, bo the body of the previous person. It might just mean that those qualities pass on, but not the actual essence of the person. I, I wonder if you have a response to that. This is one point, because, of course, it's quite easy to dismiss uh, a specific evidence. We can, okay, it may be by chance, it can be a fraud, it can be, we can make a, a uh, we can, can it, may push an envelope and we can, okay, we can assume it may be fraud. But when we, have, we, when we have to multiply this unlikelihood of 
uh, of fraud non, non detected or coincidence or whatever and so on and so forth through dozens, hundreds of scientists around the globe from different perspectives and also different um, uh, sp uh, phenomena, different spiritual experience and other phenomena all point to the same perspective. It makes a very compelling case for survival. So this is one point. And the second point, uh, what would be the most, the easiest way or the more, the, the more simple way to, to make sense of all this experience, of all this experience. All of them suggest, prima facie, that in some sense, that pers personality, or, it's, or, or at least that soul, that whatever we call it, in some sense survive with the whole features that we would identify uh, as a person, as we say, the, the memory, the character, the continuity of character and memory. This is actually the only way actually that we can investigate survival. We can we can investigate survival if we can find the continuation of the character and memory uh, related to a specific person. And what we find in, in, in these different studies, in mediumistic studies, in near-death experience studies, in out-of-body experience studies, in reincarnation studies, is the report that they has, have survived as an individual. Th that's the point. That is what they report. Of course, sometimes they report also they have a strong connection with the whole. I think uh, I, I, sometimes I because we, we know that in the Eastern tradition quite often talks about the the union, the one that we are part of of the same consciousness and so on and so forth. I try to think that maybe is the duality wave and particle that we have for light is the same thing for human beings because the, the light sometimes behaves as wave, sometimes behaves as particle, and we we are, we are just as you okay, it's wave and particle, it, it behaves as both, and so on and so forth. I, and I think the spiritual experience show exactly the same. We have experience of fusion with the whole, with God, whatever, and at the same time, we have the sense that we are experiencing this fusion, because there is someone that is experiencing this fusion. And also, the, the, the evidence, the empirical evidence that we have that that bunch of features, the personality and character, character can manifest in, in writing a poem with the style, with the memory, with uh, uh, the wills, the, the personality of that poet, can write a letter to a, to a uh, bereaved parent uh, expressing uh, his feelings, his memories, affection, so on and so forth. The same sense in the out of body experience. So I think that's the point. I think the empirical evidence is quite suggestive to that. And the idea that in some sense, uh, uh, this individual, no material being, uh, uh, in some sense survives and can manifest it in these different experiences, I think is the simplest explanation uh, and, and more natural explanation for all these experiences. Another aspect of your book focuses on near-death experience, which is, is really an area of research and inquiry, for the most part, quite different from the reincarnation research. Exactly. It's interesting because we have published a few years ago um, a, a, a systematic review of the literature, make a bibliometric analysis uh, of what has been published about uh, F, uh, about experience that suggests that conscious, there is conscious beyond the body. And the area that has been most investigated in the last decades, by far, is near-death experience. And also the research on near-death experience has become more mainstream. Even the mainstream science nowadays accepts to study, to investigate this phenomenon. And... Um, so this is one very important point. And what is most interesting regarding near-death experience, actually, what really uh, 
calls our attention is exactly the claim that while they were dead or very close to dead, in some way, their consciousness, their mind, whatever, was out of the body and had the transcendental experience. This is actually uh, uh, what uh, is most interesting on this. And, of course, there are different possible ways to, to explain a near-death experience. Of course, there is the idea that it could be just a cultural construction, it could be based on religious beliefs, it could be caused by fear of death. However, uh, these more conventional explanations have never been well supported by the empirical data that we have. That, that's the point. It's very easy to, to figure out different explanations to any phenomenon. I, we, I can explain the fall of bodies, not with gravitation. I, I can call make many different hypotheses to explain the, the, the fall of bodies. But the point is, what is the good empirical evidence on this? And regarding, for example, the more conventional explanations to near-death experience, they have been usually disproved by the empirical evidence. For example, near-death experience is not more common in, in religious people, is not more common uh, in people who were aware about the, who had knowledge about near-death experiences. Uh, uh, the reports of near-death experience were very similar in the past before it became very popular. It, the, the reports were very similar to the, the ones that we have nowadays. Fear of death does not explain uh, uh, near-death experience. Even hypoxia, the, the, the lower levels of oxygen in the brain, does not explain because people uh, who have accidents in which they were almost injured, fatally injured, but they were not, so that they, they, they had no uh, serious injury, but they ha may have near-death experiences. So, so this explanation usually does not fit well. And it's also interesting because basically all the major researchers on near-death experience that has conducted well-designed uh, scientific, scientific studies on near-death experience, almost all of them do not think that a conventional physicalist explanation explains it. And what is the what are the major reasons why near-death experience points to... To, to some transcendental aspects of human beings. First, because this is a universal experience. Second, it has a major impact on the survivors who had near-death experience. So it's different from just a hallucinatory experience. It's, we, I'm, I'm a psychiatrist. I see quite often people having hallucinatory, delusional experience in intensive care units. It's completely different from near-death experience. When people recover from hallucinatory, delusional experiences um, in, in confusional states in, in intensive care units, first, usually they don't remember anything about what happened. Or when they remember, usually they think, oh, I was completely crazy. My mind was not working well. It's completely different from the experience uh, 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 reported by people who had near-death experience. In addition, there are some studies comparing the quality of the memory. There are, there are uh, scales investigating the, the details, the quality of the memory. Uh, and when, when uh, it was compared, the quality of the memory of near-death experiences, the quality of the memory of the same person regarding real past events and imaginated past events, the... Um, near-death experience memories had a higher score in quality of memory, higher score even than real previous life events that they had. And of course, much higher than imaginated events. This is other stuff. So it matches with the feeling of the, the, the persons that, they, that it was really real or in their words, more real than real. And finally, the, perhaps the, the, the most compelling aspect of the death experience also are the veridical perceptions. People who had cardiac arrest, we know that under cardiac arrest, the brain stops working a few seconds later because the, the brain does not have um, reserves of glucose and oxygen and the brain needs a, a continuous uh, supply of oxygen and glucose. And so when, when the, the brain circulation stops, the, the blood circulation stops, the, the brain stops working. The electrical activity became, became flat in a few seconds. And people are able to report th things that actually happened during that period 
and uh, and this report has been replicated in different places and confirmed by the medical staff that were there, for example. So it, it shows um, it, it adds another evidence that the the patients were not just uh, imagining this experience. So all again, all this different evidence points again to the same uh, direction that in some sense this experience is real. That the, in some sense that the consciousness can survive beyond uh, the brain and uh, perceive things and, and uh, yeah, I think that that's that's one of the major important aspects of near death experiences. Do you see any overlap between the reincarnation data and the near death experience reports? There are some cases, and nowadays it has become more frequent to publish on this, what they call the intermission periods. Some of the reincarnation cases, uh, they report memories from the periods between lives. It's called the intermission period. In some of these reports, are similar to some of near-death experiences. I think th this is one of the similarities that they have. But uh, what? Uh, but I think they they point together reincarnation case and near-death experience. The idea that in some sense the, con the individual consciousness survives beyond the um, the brain and it it, it, it is still it is an individual consciousness that's able to, to, to think, to, to, to desire, and to, to have feelings. And, of course, the difference is that in the near-death experience, the person almost dies, or even dies for a few minutes, and then they come back. In their incarnation, of course, the, the alleged previous personality died, and years later, it would relive in another person. Another body, actually. I wonder if near death experiencers report, for example, knowledge of past lifetimes. Yes, some of them report that. It is not uh, very usual, but yes, uh, among the uh, near death experience survivors, they, they may report some knowledge of, of previous lives. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's the point. The, we can see some overlap in all these different. If you we, even as a, as a hypothesis, if we assume the hypothesis that in some sense, actually this has been the hypothesis that most uh, uh, people who actually have this experience that they in some sense assume it, and even throughout uh, the history of, for example, of Western philosophy since Plato. Uh, uh, Pythagoras and Socrates, they also had something similar. But in some sense, if we think that we, our consciousness, our conscious, our mind, in some sense, is something beyond this body that is an individual consciousness that is connected to other conscious, to the higher conscious, but is something individual. And this consciousness uh, may in some, in some moments be detached from from this this body and having out of body experiences near death experiences and they also when they died they could in some sense try to communicate using other bodies in mediumistic experiences in apparitions and also they could even relive in another body so it, it it's quite natural uh, uh, all these experiences oh, William James said. Uh, you, you one of his books that all these phenomena that I, that I just cited they feel very odd and impossible in a physicalist perspective, but they are very natural if we just suppose the continuity of consciousness. So they fit very natural. But that's the point. This is also the point that we discussed the last chapter of our book, because first, the whole humanity throughout history basically assumed this perspective based on their direct evidence or their direct experience of this phenomenon. So in, in a way or another, this hypothesis that I just proposed has, uh, has been assumed by most spiritual traditions and most world population 
throughout history. Because the evidence, even the, the personal evidence for those who live this is very compelling. And even it and this explanation uh, makes uh, makes sense of all these experiences. So it's quite natural to assume it. So what makes us currently in the academic environment to neglect this? So we discuss some cultural barriers exactly to avoid people to reach the more natural conclusion. So the, the, the results point to that direction and, uh, and because of some uh, uh, cultural barriers, we have this. I, I'm now mentoring a PhD student. Uh, he's a philosopher and Umberto, the co-author of this book, is also co-mentoring this PhD student, uh, Bruno uh, uh, and uh, we, we, we are studying, for example, philosophers who discuss the possibility of life after death. And it was very interesting because those who have stated clearly that it's not possible to have near death, to have life after death, basically they just restate a belief that everything is matter. If everything is matter, it cannot exist. But it's begging the question, because the point is like exactly, is there something beyond matter? If we start since the beginning that there is only matter, of course, this makes sense. So, so unfortunately, as I said previously, this philosophical prejudice or this dogmatic assumption of physicalism, as I said, physicalism is a respectable metaphysical stance. But what is not right to assume it as a dogma and do not allow other scientists and philosophers discuss other possibilities. What we call for is uh, in Hilakatus, a philosopher of science in Hilakatus, he calls for a Darwinian competition of research programs. So uh, we should allow in science different research programs or different paradigm candidates to work to show their value or their weaknesses, and then to see that the fittest will survive. What is not fair is to block the development or the investigation of other and different perspectives. Of course, this is a non-scientific um, attitude. Well, let me ask you uh, this, Alexander. As a practicing psychiatrist yourself, uh, working largely in the academic context. I, I am aware that in Brazil, the spiritists also operate mental health clinics, and they uh, employ mediums, and they sometimes work with past life regression in order to address various mental problems, problems of mental illness, uh, they report great success. Are those therapies something that you and your academic work consider viable? We have published some studies describing this spiritist psychiatric practices in Brazil, but until now we have not investigated the efficacy of these practices. Okay, so uh, we have actually, yes, dozens of psychiatric, spiritual psychiatric hospitals in Brazil that put together the conventional psychiatry, psychology treatments, and also they add the spiritist treatment like uh, this obsession that is the medumistic work with obsessing spirits, the lay on of hands that they call passes the regression therapy is offered as an add-on, as an, a complementary approach in addition to conventional treatment. So, yeah, it, 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 it happens. The first hospitals were founded about 100 years ago in Brazil, and many of them are still active. Unfortunately, we do not have much research on this, and, and definitely we need to do more. We have even stimulated some of these hospitals and uh, other researchers to conduct this kind of investigation. However, we know that the shortage of funds and even the some prejudice against this kind of investigation may may have uh, may, may be a problem. But in in my in my more conventional. Uh, psychiatric practice, what we have emphasized very much uh, is to take in consideration the patient's religious and spiritual beliefs and practices and stimulate them to seek support, help, and treatment in their 
different religious traditions and practices. It has been very useful. Actually, we, we just published a review paper with Mariana Costa, the other co-author, uh, reviewing the uh, cognitive behavior therapy integrated with spirituality. There are several randomized clinical trials around the globe with CBT integrated in spirituality. And in our paper, we investigate which were these spiritual integration techniques. How can we integrate them in our uh, practice in an evidence-based way, ethical and evidence-based way. And basically, one of the major uh, uh, ways to integrate is to ask the patients about their own spiritual history, their practices, what are the resources that they think they can, they, can, they can have in their spiritual beliefs, practices, and treatments, or whatever, and stimulate them to integrate them in a positive way. And of course, and in this treatment, they can have support and treatment from their religious groups. I'm guessing, but I would imagine that among these various spiritist mental health hospitals, there are qualified psychiatrists who have chosen to, to do their work there. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, the, this hospital, all of this hospital, they, they have psychiatrists and several of them with good academic background and, and psychologists and other health professionals. Yeah, definitely. So, so they are working in, in those centers, uh, basically hand in glove with spiritist mediums and uh, hypnotic regression and uh, things of that sort. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So it's basically uh, an ongoing practice over a hundred years old, but hasn't been researched very much. Yeah, exactly. The point is that research in Brazil has become more widespread and qualified in the few decades, the last decades. So it, 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 now we have a, a much higher number of well-trained researchers, international level trained researchers. And I think that very soon we will have uh, studies on that. Because I, I would imagine of all cultures, probably the, the zeitgeist in Brazil would be most open to moving in that direction. Yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, there, there is quite an openness in the Brazilian society, but even the academic environment in our uh, work in this field do actually have been we have been very well received in the, in the most of academic environment in Brazil. People are usually interested in, open, of course, in a rigorous investigation of that. That's the point. To, to discuss all these possibilities, not to be naive and accepting everything in a non-critical, in a blind way. Of course not. The idea is to, to use uh, the best of the science, of the scientific approach, to study, investigate this aspect of reality. Because, and uh, now coming back to the first question, one of the major blocks also to, to this kind of investigation is people think that if we talk about non-material aspects of nature of human being, it would be superstition or supernatural. So would be outside the realm of science. The point is, what is natural? Natural is something that's related to nature. And what is nature? That's the point. Because the, even the, the, the idea of naturalism, it's a very tricky term, naturalism. What, naturally, what does naturalism mean? Uh, it became more, much more prevalent, this word, in the end of 19th century and beginning of 20th century. And there are very different perspectives. And some people... Uh, uh, make uh, uh, naturalism as a synonym of physicalism, that nature would be only matter. But it's far from being homogeneous, th this perspective. And even nowadays, there are several authors, and we are among of them. And one, one famous philosopher of mind nowadays, Thomas Nagel, published a book, uh, Mind and Cosmos, for example, calling for a expanded naturalism and i am i'm completely in favor of that expanded naturalism that nature could involve of course the physical force and particles and could also involve 
mind consciousness as another irreducible component of nature. So this expanded naturalism would see nature as taking these both aspects intrinsically correlated. Because that's the point. Nature should tell us what nature is, not our previous theory or, or preconception should impose on nature what nature must be. I think we need to be open. If nature shows us that it, it is more than just physical parts, particles and force, we just need, need to accept that and investigate it. And if consciousness, if mind is a non-material aspect of nature, we should investigate also the natural laws that would regulate this aspect of nature. So uh, I think this is would allow us to perform a scientific investigation. So in talking about a non-physical aspect of human beings or, or of nature, we are not first denying the, the scientific knowledge and we are not going to supernaturalism, to superstition, so forth, forth. No, we are just trying, we, we are just trusting science and using science to investigate this other realm of reality. Well, one of the most fascinating aspects of your book for me was the discussion of uh, Plato and how Plato came up with a very forceful, rational argument for the non-material aspect of the human being. And I think Plato would have even said for the immortality of the soul. So Plato shows, for example, also that this discussion, even of non-physical aspect of human being and of immortality, is not also only a, a, a topic for religious discussions. Actually, it has been part of philosophical and scientific discussion since the ancient Greece. So uh, I think this is very important. And, and the, we were very happy in having among the co-authors of the book, the colleague and friend and philosopher, Humberto Schubert Coelho, who exactly is uh, very interested and does a lot of research in, in all these idealist philosophers, but also in other philosophers that consider uh, non-physical aspects of human beings. If I recall correctly, Plato based part of his argument for the immortality of the soul on an actual near-death uh, experience case. Exactly. Uh, Plato reports a uh, near-death experience case in the Republic, in the book The Republic, The Case of Air. So discuss this. And it's also very important to, to, to be aware that the uh, uh, Plato and his followers and his students, they were also deeply involved in spiritual practices. That's the point. They, they put all together. They have physical practices, exercise. They have spiritual exercises and also all these philosophical and rational uh, exercises. We, we quite often, we miss this as this spiritual aspect uh, of the, uh, uh, of the, in the oranges of the Western rational thought. Well, Alexander Moira Almeida, what a pleasure to talk to you. Congratulations on your new book. I know you're very active as a researcher, as, as well as, as you pointed out, a, a trainer of students working in this area. So I look forward to following your career closely. Thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you, Jeff. It's, it's a great pleasure always talking to you. Congratulations for this program that has been has bringing us with so many very uh, interesting ideas and bright uh, speakers. Thank you very much. My pleasure. And for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us. <music> Thank you.